Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we will discuss the articles displayed on the screen from the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 29th July 2019. So let's start our discussion. Now in continuation of our series of discussion of the questions which appeared in the prelims of 2019, let us take up this question. So it reads, consider the following statements. The first statement is that Asiatic lion is naturally found in India only. Second statement reads, double humped camel is naturally found in India only. Third statement reads, one horned rhinoceros is naturally found in India only. And the question reads, which of the statements given above is or are correct? Now the Asiatic lion or the gir lion was recently in news because of a viral disease which affected the lions in the gir sanctuary of Gujarat. And this led to the death of large number of lions in that sanctuary. Now the Asiatic lion was covered in the DNS of 21st September 2018 and also on 9th February 2019. Further regarding one horned rhinoceros, it was covered in the DNS of 29th December 2018. Now in the DNS of 21st September 2018, we have discussed that presently the Gir forest is the only habitat for wild lions and these lions face risk from epidemics, natural disasters and man-animal conflicts. Further in the DNS of 9th February 2019, we have discussed the various habitats in the state of Gujarat of this lion and this includes the Gir Sanctuary, the Gir National Park, Girnar Sanctuary, Paniya Sanctuary and the Mithyala Sanctuary. So by this you can reach the conclusion that the first statement is correct that Asiatic lion is naturally found in India only. Further in the DNS of 29 December 2018 we have discussed the distribution of greater one horned rhinoceros and in this it has been provided that it is found in India and Nepal. So by this you can easily eliminate the third statement that one horned rhinoceros is naturally found in India only. And by eliminating the third statement, you can easily eliminate the options C and D. And now that you are sure that the first statement is correct, the only option that is left is A that is one only. Hence the correct answer is that Asiatic lion is naturally found in India only. And regarding the double humped camel, it is found in Central Asia. Now after this, let us take up the discussion of today's newspaper. Now this article on page number 11 talks about the Shimla agreement which was signed between India and Pakistan after the war of 1971. Now recently a controversy has started after the American president said that the Indian Prime Minister asked him for mediation between the India and Pakistan to resolve the Kashmir conflict. So in this background the author has highlighted the importance of Shimla agreement and how this Shimla agreement could guide the relations between India and Pakistan with a little change in this agreement. And if you go through the previous year questions in the mains examination of 2013 in the general studies paper 1, there was a question which read, analyze the circumstances that led to the Tashkent agreement in 1966, discuss the highlights of the agreement. So this Tashkent agreement was signed in 1966 after the war between India and Pakistan of 1965. Similarly, this Shimla agreement was signed after the war of 1971 during which Bangladesh was liberated. And without getting much into the details of this article, let us try and understand what were the circumstances that led to the war between India and Pakistan in 1971 and what are the key highlights of the Simla agreement. Now the circumstances which led to a war between India and Pakistan in the year 1971 has been discussed in detail in the NCRT of class 12th, which is politics in India since independence. So we will look at some important points and the circumstances which led to the war between India and Pakistan from this NCRT. Now before 1971, Bangladesh was a part of Pakistan and was known as the East Pakistan and the present day Pakistan was known as the West Pakistan. So in the early 1970s, Pakistan was facing an internal crisis and during the first general election, there was a split verdict and in this split verdict, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto emerged as the winner in West Pakistan, which is the present day Pakistan, while the Awami League leader, who is known as Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, had won in the East Pakistan. And the Awami League had won in the East Pakistan because the citizens of the East Pakistan, who were of Bengali origin, were treated as second class citizen by the present day Pakistan or the West Pakistan. And even when the Awami League led by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman had won the election in East Pakistan, the Pakistani rulers of West Pakistan were not ready to accept this democratic verdict. And instead of making him a part of the government, the Pakistani army arrested Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And this led to a severe crisis in Bangladesh. 
And after the arrest of the Awami League leader Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, the Pakistani army had unleashed a reign of terror. So in response to the torture by the West Pakistani army, the people of East Pakistan started a struggle to liberate Bangladesh from Pakistan. And due to this crisis and confrontation between the Pakistani army and the people of East Pakistan, there was a big refugee crisis. And throughout 1971, India had to bear the burden of about 80 lakh refugees who fled from East Pakistan and took shelter in the neighboring areas in India. And mainly, these people migrated to West Bengal and Assam, etc. And to fight this refugee crisis, India extended moral and material support to the freedom struggle in Bangladesh. In short, India supported the Bangladeshi people's freedom struggle. Now, the refugee crisis was the immediate cause of the war between India and Pakistan. Now, after understanding the immediate cause of the war between India and Pakistan in the year 1971, let us understand what was the situation of the geopolitics at that point of time. As we all know that after the Second World War, the world was witnessing a cold war between the United States of America and the USSR. Now, during that time, the world was divided into two military camps. One was supported by the USA while the other was supported by the erstwhile USSR and in those circumstances the Pakistan was supported by the United States of America and the China. And due to this increasing closeness between the United States and Pakistan, India in order to counter this US-Pakistan-China axis had signed a treaty of peace and friendship with Soviet Union or the erstwhile USSR in the year 1971. And under this treaty of peace and friendship, the USSR had assured India of support in case India was attacked by any other country. And under these circumstances, a full-scale war started between India and Pakistan in the December of 1971. And in this war, India retaliated using the Air Force, Navy and the Army. And in this operation, India was welcomed and supported by the local population of East Pakistan or the present-day Bangladesh. And within 10 days, the Indian army had surrounded Dhaka from three sides and the Pakistani army of about 90,000 soldiers had surrendered by then. And after the end of 1971 war, the then Prime Minister of India, Srimati Indira Gandhi and Zulfikar Ali Bhutto signed an agreement which is famously known as the Shimla Agreement. So in this background, let us understand what are the key features of the Shimla Agreement. So the Simla agreement was signed by the then Prime Minister of India, Srimati Indira Gandhi and the President Zulfikar Ali Bhutto of Pakistan on 2nd July 1972. And this agreement was not just a peace treaty, but was a comprehensive blueprint for good neighborly relations between India and Pakistan. And under this Simla agreement, both the countries decided to abjure from conflict and confrontation. And they agreed to work towards the establishment of durable peace friendship and cooperation between the two. And in this background, the Simla agreement contains a set of guiding principles mutually agreed by India and Pakistan, which both sides would adhere to while managing the relations with each other. And the main emphasis of the Shimla agreement was respect for each other's territorial integrity and sovereignty, further non-interference in each other's internal affairs, respect for each other's unity, political independence, sovereign equality and abjuring hostile propaganda. So for establishing durable peace, friendship and cooperation between India and Pakistan, following principles were agreed during the Simla agreement. The first is a mutual commitment to peaceful resolution of all issues through direct bilateral approaches. So which means that this does not allow for mediation from other countries and all the issues between the two will be decided based on bilateral approaches only. The second is to build the foundation of a cooperative relationship with special focus on people to people contact. And in this importance has been assigned to trade relations and people to people contact through religious pilgrimage, etc. The third and the most important principle is to uphold the inviolability of the line of control in Jammu and Kashmir, which is most important confidence building measure between India and Pakistan and is a key to durable peace. Further, it was decided that the principles and the purposes of the Charter of the United Nations shall govern the relations between the two countries. And in case any difference arises between the two, the two countries are resolved to settle these differences by peaceful means through bilateral negotiations or by any other peaceful means mutually agreed upon between them. 
Now, after the war ended between India and Pakistan, a line of control was finalized. And as you can see in this map, this was the line of control which was finalized in the Simla agreement. So both the countries decided that the line of control resulting from the ceasefire of December 1971 shall be respected by both the sides without prejudice to the recognized positions of the either side. Further, neither side shall seek to alter it unilaterally irrespective of mutual differences or legal interpretations which means that this position cannot be changed anymore after this agreement was signed. And both the sides will further undertake to refrain from the threat or the use of force in the violation of this line of control or the LOC. So these were a few guiding principles which were decided by India and Pakistan in the Simla agreement of 1972. And these were to guide the relations between India and Pakistan post the 1971 war. However, the principles which were decided in the Simla agreement have not been followed in their letter and spirit. And we have seen many of the ceasefire violations along the line of control. And recently a controversy started when the American president said that the Indian Prime Minister had asked him to mediate on solving the issue of Kashmir between India and Pakistan. And this was particularly seen as a violation of the Simla agreement because all the issues between both the countries will be resolved through direct bilateral approaches without mediation or intervention of a third party. So after this discussion, you can try and answer this question from your mains examination point of view. And with this, let's move to the next article. Now regarding this article on page number 10, you should understand that the government has committed itself to a path of fiscal consolidation under the FRBM Act. And under this path of fiscal consolidation, the government is targeting to reduce the fiscal deficit to 3% of the GDP. In this line, this article argues that the government's sole focus on reducing the fiscal deficit is not sound economic management. And apart from fiscal deficit, the government's focus should mainly be on reducing the revenue deficit. So in this article, we will try to understand why should the government focus on reducing the revenue deficit and not just focus on the fiscal deficit. And before understanding the details of this article, let us try and understand what is meant by the term fiscal deficit and the term revenue deficit. Now, during the budget or the annual financial statement, the government provides a key statement related to the sources of revenue for itself, as well as the areas in which it spends. So in this regard, if the government is spending more as compared to its sources of revenue, there is a fiscal deficit. So in this line, the fiscal deficit has been defined as the difference between the government's total expenditure minus its total receipts excluding the borrowings. Now, as we all know that the borrowings are liability on the government. So that is why the fiscal deficit has been defined as the government's total expenditure minus its original sources of revenue, which do not create any debt on the government. So by looking at this formula, you can understand that it is equal to the total expenditure minus revenue receipts plus all those capital receipts which are non-debt creating or in short, which do not create any liability. So as has been explained further, not debt creating capital receipts are those receipts which are not borrowings and therefore do not give rise to debt. Now as those sources which do not create liability on the government are limited, while the government's expenditure is more, that is why there is fiscal deficit and this fiscal deficit is financed by various borrowings by the government. So it simply indicates the total borrowing requirements of the government from all these sources. Now these details have been given in the macroeconomics NCRT of class 12th. So you can go through the details from this NCRT. So simply the gross fiscal deficit reflects the total borrowing of the government from all the sources. So it includes the net borrowing at home borrowing from the RBI and borrowing from abroad. Now further, if you look at the sources of money for the government, these are through the revenue receipts and through the capital receipts. Now revenue receipts include all the revenue from the tax revenue as well as several other sources of non-tax revenues like the stamp duties, etc. However, the capital receipts are mainly from the disinvestment of PSUs or from the sale of any other assets of the government. Now, besides the revenue receipts and the capital receipts, the government spends its money on revenue expenditure as well as on capital expenditure. And regarding this revenue expenditure, you should note that this is the expenditure which is incurred for the purposes other than the creation of physical or financial assets of the central government. 
So this simply means that the revenue expenditure is that expenditure of the government which does not create any physical or financial asset for the government and it relates to those expenses which are incurred for normal functioning of the government departments and various services also includes interest payments on the debt incurred by the government, grant given to the state governments and other parties etc. Now as the revenue expenditure does not lead to the creation of any physical asset or financial asset for the government, it shows that this expenditure does not have a positive impact on the economy of the country. On the other hand, if the government spends more on the capital expenditure, which leads to the creation of physical and financial assets, it will be more beneficial for the economy. So that is why the revenue deficit has been defined as revenue expenditure minus the revenue receipts. And as we have learned that the revenue expenditure does not lead to the creation of physical or financial assets and revenue receipts include the tax revenue as well as the non-tax revenue. Now what is the impact of having such a revenue deficit? So when the government incurs a revenue deficit, it implies that the government is not saving enough and it is using up the savings of the other sectors of the economy to finance a part of its consumption expenditure which means that such expenditure or increase in the revenue deficit will not lead to a very positive impact on the economy because such expenditure does not focus on the physical or the creation of financial assets. And this situation means that the government will have to borrow not only to finance its investments but also its consumption requirements. And as you should be knowing that increase in the consumption expenditure does not have any positive impact on the economy. Further, it has been said that this will lead to a buildup of the stock of debt and interest liabilities on the government. Further, another impact of the increase in revenue deficit is that often the governments reduce the productive capital expenditure or the welfare expenditure if the revenue deficit is increasing. And this would mean lower growth and adverse welfare implications. So now after understanding the difference between the fiscal deficit and the revenue deficit, let us look at the key points which have been highlighted by the article. For more details on the government budgeting and various other kinds of deficit like the fiscal deficit, revenue deficit, what is meant by government debt and what is meant by primary deficit, you should refer to this NCRT of class 12th which is related to the introduction to macroeconomics. Now the author in this article has highlighted that the fiscal deficit alone may not provide a true and complete picture of the government finances and both the fiscal and the revenue deficit are required to be lowered for efficient management of public finances. So in this line if you look at the fiscal deficit for the financial year 2018 and 19 it was at about 3.4 percent of the GDP. Now as compared to this fiscal deficit the revenue deficit was about 2.2 percent. And this shows that the revenue deficit accounts for about two-third of the total fiscal deficit. And this shows that some of the government's borrowing has been diverted towards meeting its operational expenses or the consumption expenditure. And as we have learned that more amount of revenue deficit is not good for economy as explained in the NCRT. Now what are the implications of increasing revenue deficit? So as we have learned it first increases the public debt of a country. Further, this also means that it leads to higher borrowings to meet our operational expenses and it also leads to intergenerational inequity. And what is meant by this intergenerational inequity? So in order to repay the present borrowings, the government has to resort to imposition of higher taxes on the next generation. So if the present government borrows more in the form of revenue deficit, it will lead to a higher burden of taxes on the coming generations and that is why not much amount will be available with them for the creation of physical assets or for improving and increasing the investments in the economy. Now as the high revenue deficit has negative implications on the economy, the author has argued that reduction in the fiscal deficit by the government may not provide a true picture since such a reduction may be brought about through the reduction in capital expenditure which is undesirable. Now here you should note that the capital expenditure has certain positive impacts on the economy because it leads to the creation of physical and financial assets for the economy. However, for reducing the fiscal deficit, if the government is trying to cut down this capital expenditure, it will have a negative impact on the economy. So the author has argued that the government should not singly focus on the reduction of fiscal deficit 
However, it should focus on reduction in revenue deficit, which shows the consumption expenditure of the government and does not lead to any creation of physical or financial assets. Further, the author has highlighted that the government in the recent budget has announced that it will borrow money through the issue of overseas sovereign bonds. So in this line, author has further provided a caution and he has said that this raises further the concerns because the revenue deficit is major part of the fiscal deficit and we would resort to international borrowings to finance our current operational expenses. Now regarding the various implications of India opting for overseas bonds, we have discussed that in the DNS of 14th July 2019. So you can go through that video. So in short, the author in this article has highlighted that the government should not just focus on reducing the fiscal deficit. However, its main focus should be on reducing the revenue deficit, which leads to an increasing debt on the government. Now to better understand and appreciate this article, you should first go through the macroeconomics NCRT of class 12 and understand the various concept of government budgeting. And after that, you should try and understand this article. With this, let's move to the next article. Now recently, an inter-ministerial committee was set up to assess the viability of virtual currencies and it has recommended that India should ban private cryptocurrencies such as bitcoins. So in this line, this will fall under general studies paper three under the topic Indian economy. So in this article, let us try to understand what are virtual currencies and what is cryptocurrency? What is the interministerial committee's view on these cryptocurrencies? And why have the private cryptocurrencies been banned? Now, first let us understand what is meant by the term virtual currencies. So simply a virtual currency is a digital representation of value that can be digitally traded and functions as First, a medium of exchange, a unit of account or a store of value. However, such currency or such virtual currencies are not legal tender and they do not have the backing of a government. So simply any group of people on internet can opt for a virtual currency without the backing of the government. And that virtual currency can be used as a medium of exchange. It can be used as a unit of account or a store of value. However, all such currencies are not legal tender and they do not have the backing of the government or the central bank of a country. And cryptocurrency is simply a subset of these virtual currencies and it is decentralized and governs on the function of blockchain technology and these are protected by cryptography. So here what is meant by blockchain technology and various aspects of the blockchain have been discussed in the DNS of 21st July 2019. That is recently we have discussed all the aspects of the blockchain technology. So you should go through this video to understand the various aspects of blockchain technology. And here it is important to understand that cryptocurrency functions on the basis of this blockchain technology, which is decentralized in nature. Now, after this, let us understand what is the view of this interministerial committee on the cryptocurrencies. So regarding the view of this interministerial committee on the distributed ledger technologies or the blockchain technologies and the cryptocurrencies, it recognizes the potential of the blockchain technology and it accepts that internationally the application of blockchain technology is being explored in the areas of trade finance, mortgage loan applications, digital identity management or KYC or know your customer requirements, cross border fund transfers and clearing and settlement systems. So as the IMC has recognized the potential of the blockchain technologies and the cryptocurrency, it has recommended the Department of Economic Affairs to take necessary measures to facilitate the use of these distributed ledger technologies or the blockchain technologies in the entire financial field after identifying its uses. Further, it has recommended that regulators like RBI, the Securities and Exchange Board of India, Insurance Regulatory Development Authority, and the Pension Fund Regulatory Development Authority to explore evolving appropriate regulations for the development of blockchain technology in their respective areas. So in short, the IMC has recommended that there should be proper regulation by various regulators like the RBI and SEBI for exploring the development of blockchain technology in their respective fields. However, one point should be noted that the IMC has recommended a ban on the private cryptocurrencies which indirectly means that it recognizes that there should be a cryptocurrency which can be unveiled by the Reserve Bank of India or the RBI. This is particularly because such a cryptocurrency will have the backing of the Central Bank of India, which is the 
Reserve Bank of India. However, the private cryptocurrencies do not have a backing of the government or the central bank. And that is why it has recommended a ban on such currencies. Further, it is to be noted that the RBI Act has the enabling provisions to permit the central government to approve a central bank digital currency as a legal tender in India. So in this background, let us understand why the IMC has recommended a ban on the private cryptocurrencies and what are the dangers or issues with the implementation or the use of private cryptocurrencies. Now the main contention of the inter-ministerial committee is that without a central regulating authority, such private cryptocurrencies can have negative consequences. So the first concern that has been raised is that Non-official virtual currencies can be used to defraud consumers, particularly those consumers which come from vulnerable sections or unsophisticated consumers or the investors. And an example of this is the Bitcoin related Ponzi scheme which resulted in a fraud of around rupees 2000 crore. And regarding Ponzi schemes, you should note that these are such investment schemes which are not based on any asset and that is why ultimately they lose their valuations and lead to a loss for the investors. The second concern is that these private cryptocurrencies often experience tremendous volatility in their value. For example, Bitcoin was selling at $20,000 per coin in December 2017. However, in less than a year, it was trading at just $3,800 per coin, which shows that its value has been fluctuating a lot in the recent times. And that is why such volatility poses severe challenges for investors. Thirdly, the committee has said that in a country like India, where lakhs of traders get involved in such currencies and particularly small and retail traders, this could have huge negative implications. Now, another important concern which has been raised by the interministerial committee is related to the environmental concerns of creation and circulation of private cryptocurrencies. So the report highlights that the scaling up of currency system over a large population would require crippling levels of energy resources. And as we have learned in the video of blockchain that use of blockchain technology and the generation of cryptocurrency requires a lot of processing power and that is why it requires a lot of energy. And due to the increasing levels of energy consumption, it can lead to an environmental disaster. The third concern of the IMC is related to the power of RBI in regulating such currencies. And this report highlights that if private cryptocurrencies are allowed to function as legal tender, the RBI would lose control over the monetary policy and financial stability. This is because it would not be able to keep a tap on the money supply in the economy. Now as we know that currently RBI regulates the monetary system of India and also tries and controls the inflation and various other aspects of the economy. However, if such private cryptocurrencies are floated and they are not regulated by a centralized authority, the power of RBI will be lost considerably. Another major concern is the anonymity of such private digital currencies and cryptocurrencies. And this anonymity can lead to instances of money laundering and use of this money for terrorist financing activities. And it would further make it difficult for the law enforcement agencies to control such cryptocurrencies. And finally, the report highlights that there is no grievance redressal mechanism in such a system. And this is because all the transactions are irreversible in nature. And as we have learned in the video of blockchain technology, no tempering can be done with the data in the blockchains. So these are few concerns which have been raised by the report of the interministerial committee. Now, after this, let us understand the ways in which the cryptocurrencies are regulated in various other countries. So this table lists down the various aspects of the cryptocurrencies. For example, is it considered as a legal tender in one country or not? Or is it allowed as a payment method, as an investment token? Or is this currency being traded in the crypto exchanges? Now, as far as cryptocurrency as a legal tender is concerned, it has not been allowed in any of the countries. For example, Russia, China, Switzerland, Thailand, Japan, etc. However, cryptocurrency has been identified as a payment method by Switzerland. Thailand, Japan, with some restrictions in New York, as well as in Canada. Further, it has been recognized as an investment asset or as investment token by Russia, Switzerland, Thailand, Japan, New York, Canada, etc. 
However, China is the only currency which has outrightly banned cryptocurrency and is not allowed as either legal tender, payment method, investment token and has not allowed cryptocurrencies to be traded on crypto exchanges. Now, as various jurisdictions are allowing the use of cryptocurrency to a limited extent, except China, the editorial argues that the government should not resort to outright banning of such currencies and should regulate such currencies to explore the use of new and advanced technologies on which the cryptocurrencies are based. So these were few aspects of the cryptocurrencies and why are the private cryptocurrencies banned? And these can be important aspects for us from mains examination point of view. And with this, let's move to the next article. Now this article on page number seven is related to a virus which is infecting Android phones across the world. And according to the cybercrime officials of India, this agent Smith malware has attacked the highest number of victims who are Indians. Now what is important in this article for us is the name of this virus and that is important for us from the preliminary examination point of view under the topic general science and also it forms a part of the topic security in the general studies paper 3 of the mains examination. Now why is the name of this virus important for us from the preliminary examination point of view? So if you go through the question that was asked in the year 2018 in the preliminary examination, it read the terms WannaCry. Petya and Eternal Blue sometimes mentioned in the news recently are related to which of the following. So all these were related to cyber attacks. And in our prelims question discussion in the last year, we had discussed this in the DNS of 21st June 2018. So as you can see, the UPSC generally asks us simple questions related to the names of the important viruses or malwares that are in news. So similarly, the name of this virus, which is known as Agent Smith, becomes important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. And you can simply expect a question on the term agent related has sometimes been in news and it is related to which of the following type questions. Now here we don't need to get into the details of how this Agent Smith is infecting and what is the data, etc. The only thing that is important is that Agent Smith is a virus which is infecting Android phones across the world and Indians are the most vulnerable to this viral attack because the investigating agencies have shown that 59% of the people who are infected by this Agent Smith are Indians. Certain aspects of this Agent Smith virus will be provided in the PDF which is attached to this video so you can go through that. With this let's move to the next article. Now this article on page number one is related to the Australia's view and contention regarding the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So in this line, Australia has asserted that government must convince industry about the benefits of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. Now this is a developing story and it is a news in transition. However, let us understand what is meant by this term Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and who are the members of this RCEP. And this can be a very important aspect for us from the preliminary examination point of view. Now in the prelims compass magazine of the international relations, the basics of the regional comprehensive economic partnership from the preliminary examination point of view have been discussed. And you should understand that RCEP is intended to be a free trade agreement, which is currently being negotiated between ASEAN plus six. And it includes 10 countries which are part of the ASEAN grouping. And besides these ASEAN group, the plus six countries include Australia, China, India, Japan, New Zealand and South Korea. Now these economic partnership negotiations are being led by ASEAN and they are based on the vision of centrality of the ASEAN countries or the association of Southeast Asian nations. Now presently the ASEAN grouping has free trade agreements with the six countries. So it wants to consolidate these free trade agreements into one regional comprehensive economic partnership. And as we have learned, these six members are Australia, China, India, Japan, New Zealand and South Korea. Now various issues have been in news and this comes up regularly and has not been finalized till now. So the detailed aspects of the RCEP and what are the contentions of India will be discussed in any DNS if an article comes up in the newspaper. However, today we will restrict just to the membership of the RCEP and what is the main aspect of RCEP. Now, if you look at the previous year questions in the year 2018, there was a question which read, consider the following countries. 
and it asked which of the above are among the free trade partners of the ASEAN or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. So as we have learned here that the ASEAN has free trade agreements with all these countries. Now an important logic to solve this question was that USA was negotiating Trans-Pacific Partnership or the TPP against the RCEP which simply meant that USA was not a part of RCEP or the Regional Economic Comprehensive Partnership. However, recently the USA has withdrawn itself from the TPP also. Now, if you know that USA is not a part of the RCEP or TPP, you can simply eliminate the options A, B and D. And that is how you arrive at your answer that C is the correct answer. That is 1, 3, 4 and 5 are the countries which are having free trade agreement with the ASEAN. And these countries are Australia, 1-3, China, India and Japan. So Canada and USA are not having free trade agreement with ASEAN. With this, let's move to the next article. Now after today's discussion, you should try and answer these questions and the answer will be displayed after 5 seconds. The first question reads, which of the following are considered as a part of the revenue expenditure under the union budget? The first is subsidies, second is loans and advances to the state governments and the third is the grants given to the states. Now as we have learned today that revenue expenditure includes all those expenditures which do not lead to the creation of physical assets or the financial assets and that is why subsidies are a part of revenue expenditure and also the grants given to the state government are part of the revenue expenditure. However, the loans and advances which are given to the state governments are the assets of the central government and these leads to the creation of financial assets because the government will ultimately earn money on these investments and that is why these are not the part of revenue expenditure but are part of the capital expenditure. Hence the correct answer is 1 and 3 and that is B. The second question reads which of the following are correct about the fiscal deficit? So the first statement reads, it indicates the total borrowing requirements of the government from all sources. And as we have learned today, the fiscal deficit indicates the total borrowings of the government. The second statement reads, it is the difference between the government's total expenditure and its total receipts including the borrowing, which is incorrect because it is the difference between government's total expenditure and its total receipts excluding the borrowing part. And that is why second statement is incorrect. Hence, the correct answer is one only. Now, after this, you should try and answer these two questions and the answer will be displayed after five seconds. The first question reads, consider the following statements about the private cryptocurrencies. The first is that these are recognized as legal tender by the RBI, which is incorrect as we have learned in today's article. The second is that these are regulated in India by RBI, which is also incorrect because the private cryptocurrencies are neither regulated in India and nor they have been recognized as legal tender money. And that is why the correct answer here is D that is neither one nor two. The fourth question reads agent Smith sometimes mentioned in news recently is related to. So as we have learned today, it is an Android virus and India is the most vulnerable and infected by this virus. With this, we have come to the end of today's discussion. Now let's move on to the question for the day. 